All right, gang, here we go. This is Chem 1, Unit 1, Part 3 uh, notes. So this is the very end of the Chem 1 unit uh, notes that we're doing for this uh, unit. So you're coming up on your very first exam in Chem 1. Um, I suggest that you work through the practice problems. You come and ask for help. Get, uh, you know, ask those questions that you have. Make sure you understand every little thing. Everything, it, there seems, we've only been in class for like, a week and change, but there's actually quite a bit that we've already talked about. Okay, so today we're just going to wrap up talking about matter, how we classify matter in chemistry, and a little bit about the periodic table. Okay, so elements is the simplest form of matter that has a unique set of properties. So that means like uh, when you look at the periodic table, every single box on that periodic table, whether it be oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, or lead, or any of those, they all have their own unique properties. And, but if we take one of those things, say we take a carbon atom and we split it in half so it's no longer carbon, it no longer has the same properties that individual carbons do. Okay? But if you had a chunk of carbon and you split it into two little pieces of carbon, then each of those pieces of carbon would have the same exact properties as the carbon when it was all together. But as soon as you get down to one atom of it and you split that guy in half, all of a sudden it's going to have totally different properties than it did before. All right, uh, so when we say they cannot be broken down, pretty much we mean that that's the smallest uh, chunk of matter that still has the same properties as the bigger chunks of matter, okay? We always represent uh, elements as chemical symbols, okay? And we use one or two letters to represent them, okay? So like hydrogen, right, is just like that. It's just an H, oxygen is just like that, carbon is just like that. If it happens to be one that has two letters, then it, one's going to be capitalized and one's going to be lowercase. So we have like uh, chlorine is Cl, all right? Now, on uh, be careful, like one of the biggest beginner mistakes that I've noticed is that people will see this guy here, okay? We use this, this is hydrochloric acid. We'll use this quite a lot. It's kind of like the simplest quintessential strong acid. Uh, makes it very handy to do lots of little simple experiments to show properties. Uh, some people refer that to this as HCI, thinking this is an I at the end. That is not the case, this is HCl, so hydrogen and uh, chlorine, all right? So you gotta be careful of that. For me personally, just to make sure I don't get confused, if I need to write an iodine or an I for iodine, I always go ahead and put the top and the bottom on it, just to keep it clear. But anyway, all right, so second letter is always lowercase, first letter is capital, okay? So like another one, uh, let's just do one more example. So lead is PB. So it's capital P because it's the first letter, lowercase b for the second letter, okay? Now compounds are what you get when you take two chemicals or two elements and you combine them chemically. Now, when you, one thing you need to think to yourself is when you see this term chemically, this really means that they're bonded, okay? There's some sort of chemical bond holding them together, okay? If you see physically, okay, if you say something's combined physically, that means there's no bond hold them to, holding them together. There might be like little weak forces called intermolecular forces that are kind of like holding them together, but they are not bonded with chemical bonds, all right? So there's a big difference. So when you see the word chemically, automatically thinks that they mean bonded. I don't know why I added this extra N. Bonded, B-O-N-D-E-D. -E yeah. All right, anyway, so the, the interesting thing with uh, compounds is like the individual properties of those compounds are sometimes vastly different than the elements that make them up. So if you think about hydrogen, if you take H2 and oxygen like that and combine them, them together, then you get an explosion. Okay, uh, if you've heard of the Hindenburg, right? The Hindenburg was that giant blimp thing, <clears throat> right? It looks something like this. Oh, you're gonna see my drawings. Anyway, so there's these people and all of a sudden there's filled with hydrogen, so it floats and then all of a sudden, oh, it wasn't filled with people. They had like a little carrying basket down here. Anyway, so there's hydrogen up here. There was a little spark that got it started and it started bursting into flame because there was hydrogen in here, oxygen surrounding it because that's what we breathe. That's what's in our atmosphere, and the Hindenburg, uh, you know, blew up and sank. Okay, but if you take these guys and combine them chemically, right, <clears throat> then we get this water. Now, if our uh, if our Hindenburg was filled with water, was it would it blow up? Well, no, water doesn't burn in oxygen, right? So it's kind of interesting. Like there's thousands and thousands of examples of this that if we take hydrogen and oxygen. Or if we take two individual elements, they'll have different properties, combine them, and they'll have different properties than how they started. Okay. Now, uh, one thing you need to start getting used to is how to read 
chemical formulas. Okay, we use subscripts to represent the proportion of one element to another in a compound. So let's go to one you already know. You know that uh, water is one oxygen with two hydrogens attached. So that two applies to the hydrogen, right? Two hydrogens, one oxygen. Okay, uh, you know we just talked about hydrochloric acid, right? This is one hydrogen and two chlorine, or one chlorine, excuse me. Okay, so there's, you know, these subscripts, we don't write the ones, but we assume that they're there. Okay, um, what's another one? Oh, we could do something fancy. We could say H3PO4 2. Oh, that's not a great example. Um, well, whatever. And so if we do, if we do that guy, H3PO4 2, this isn't a real comical, but that's what popped into my head for whatever reason. This means we've got uh, three hydrogens, and this two will apply to this phosphorus, and we got two phosphorus. And then this two also applies to this oxygen, so that means there's also eight oxygens in here. Okay, and so that's what how those subscripts all kind of combine together. All right. <clears throat> now mixtures. So we just talked about comp compounds. Those are things that are bonded chemically, meaning they they've got bonds holding them together. Remember, physical means there there might be forces holding them together, but there's no actual bonds holding them together. Okay, so a mixture is is physical blend. Right, no bonds. There's two different types of mixtures that we're going to worry about. There's heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. Heterogeneous mixtures are not uniform throughout in composition, and they have more than one phase. All right. So some examples of this. So if you think about like if you had a cup of ice water. No, that's not a good one. How about a cup of a soda with ice? Right. You've got a cup and it's filled with soda, and then you've put some ice cubes in there. Okay. If you look at this container, this is mixed, right? You've got soda and ice, and it's mixed together. You can stir it up. It's all mixed. But it's, it has more than one phase, okay? By phases, we mean, like, distinct layers. So it has more than one distinct layer. So in here, we've got one layer that's soda, okay? And then we've got another layer that's the ice, okay? And it can be all mixed up. It doesn't really matter. Ice floats in soda. It doesn't really matter, okay? Uh, we could also have salads, right? If you if you go and get a salad, then it's got lettuce in some parts and tomatoes, black olives, onions, uh, maybe some, you know, peppers or something like that, some salad dressing, all those different phases. Those are distinct parts of your salad. You could also think about, like, garden soil, okay? You know, in garden soil, you've got dirt, and you've got maybe sometimes you've got a little piece of rock, you've got some fertilizer, you know, stuff like that. All right, in homogeneous mixtures, they're uniform throughout, meaning they're completely the same in, in composition, and they're all one phase, okay? <clears throat> so that means throughout the whole thing, no matter what piece you take from it, you're going to get a sequel, an equal amount of everything. Imagine if you took a, a cup of water, just plain water, and you dumped in um, a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down, right? And so you dump in a spoonful of sugar, and now your water is... Uh, in your cup, it's 3% water, and you've mixed it up so it's all thoroughly mixed, and you take a sip of it, um, that, and you took a sip from it, 97% of the water you just drank, or the liquid that you just drank is water, and 3% of the liquid you drank was sugar, right? And if you take another sip, then it's still, uh, I, did, I probably added up my percentage is wrong. So if you have, I can't remember what I said now. So if you have a, if you added in one percent sugar, ninety-nine percent of the water you drank was what uh, of the liquid you drank was water, and one percent of it was sugar. Okay, if you you know you mix it up some more, you take another sip, you still only get one percent sugar, ninety-nine percent water. You take another sip, one percent sugar, ninety-nine percent water. It doesn't matter. Um, what part of the liquid you take it from either. You could use a straw to drink it from the very bottom of the cup or you could use a spoon to scoop it off the very top. That's throughout the whole cup is an equal amount of sugar to water. Okay, so it's all one phase, meaning there's no distinct layers. All right, we often call these solutions, all right? Um, so some examples of solutions. So we just talked about, um, you know, salt. So we've got salt water. You know, if you take salt, mix it with water. Sugar water, right? We just talked about that one. Okay. Um, you could also have, let's see, uh, air is a homogeneous mixture. Uh, if you think about, like, if you close the door to a room and you let it sit for a while, you know, and don't mix anything in there. Uh, if you go to one part of the room and you take a cup and you 
close the lid so it's trapped that air inside and then you go to another part of the room and you do the same thing with a different cup the percentages of nitrogen oxygen and carbon dioxide and all the other gases that are in there are going to be equal to one another okay so that's a homogeneous mixture um, uh, another one is alloys okay so alloys are mixtures of metal okay um, so if you take like steel as an alloy okay um, it's, uh, it's a mixture of mo many different elemental metals if you mix those together and you have a chunk of steel then that is also a homogeneous mixture or a solution okay let's jump back here and we're going to draw ourselves a little concept map of matter and the whole point of this is so that you can go through um, you can take any piece of matter and try to decide how to classify it all right so if you've got a chunk of matter right remember matter uh, has mass and volume okay so it has mass and takes up space all right so you ask yourself is it uniform okay so you ask yourself all right is this matter uniform all right if it is not uniform no then it automatically has to be a heterogeneous mixture straight up no questions asked all right so if there's any sort of variability in its composition uh, then it's then it's automatically heterogeneous mixture all right then if the answer is yes we have to ask ourselves another question we say, all right, so it's uniform throughout the whole thing, but uh, does it have variable composition? Now, what's, what's this mean? So variable, remember, means it can change, and then composition is what it's made out of. So if we look at the individual pieces, if they're made out of different things, then it has variable composition. So, like, uh, so if we look at salt water, okay, say yes on that question. So if, it's, if we have salt water, and we mix it up, okay, um, then it's uniform throughout the whole thing. We just talked about how at the bottom it's going to be the same percentage of salt water as it is at the top, okay. Now, does it have variable composition? Yes, because it's made out of water molecules, okay, and salt molecules, okay. All right, so we call this, so if it has variable compositions, okay, then this guy here is a homogeneous mixture. Okay, and remember we call this a solution. Don't forget that, all right? So, all right, now we go back here. So what if our answer is no? No. Then we, we know for whatever we have, then it's gonna be a pure substance, right? Because it's uniform throughout and it has vari variable composition. So everything in it is the same. So we say, okay, does it have um, more than one kind of atom? All right, so ask yourself, does it have more than one kind of atom? All right, and if the answer is no for that, okay, then we know it's an element. If every single atom is there is exactly the same as the other atoms that were in there, then it's an element. If the answer is yes, it does have more than one kind of element, then we know it's a compound. All right, so let's do one or two real quick. So what if we take, if we take water, just pure H2O, okay, so we have a, a box of water, Okay, I don't know why you have a box of water, but you do. Okay, is it uniform? Well, yeah, everything in here is water. Okay, all right, so yes, it is water. So does it have variable composition? Well, if we think about it, does this what's making up our water? Well, we've got uh, H2Os and H2Os and H2Os and H2O. Okay, so everything H2O, okay, so it does not have variable composition, all right? Does it have more than one kind of atom? Well, let's see, so we've got H2O, right? So this is made out of hydrogens and oxygen. So yes, it does have more than one kind of atom, so therefore it's a compound. So water, if you have a case of pure water, it's a compound, all right? So that's kind of how you work through. Do some of those practice problems. All right, now, if you have a mixture, remember mixtures mean they're combined physically. Combined physically. So that means we can break them up physically as well. Okay, so we're going to separate them physically, remember? So that means we're not going to break bonds, all right? And we don't need a chemical reaction. So here's some different things we can use to separate mixtures, all right? And you're going to practice this in our lab. So if we have a, mix, a filtration, well, I don't really want that sticking out there like that. I'll do it on the other side. So if we have 
uh, filtration, this is pretty easy. Imagine like if you've made coffee in your home coffee pot or something like that, you know, you've got like the coffee filter pad and you, you know, stick it on the thing and then you pour the coffee grounds on there and then the, you know, the, the, the little coffee mate mix drops uh, or runs hot water through it and pulls out the coffee taste and the other chemicals that are supposed to be in your coffee and leaves the coffee grounds behind, right? It gets filtered. Okay. Uh, distillation happens kind of like what's going on here in this little video or in this little picture here. Okay. So we've got a distiller machine. So in here we've got some sort of a mixture of uh, liquids. Okay. All right. So it's a mixture of liquids, and it uh, distillation helps us separate based on the boiling point. Okay. So you've got a mixture, so say you've got a chunk of gasoline in there. And gasoline is made out of like octane and butane and propane and heptane and a whole bunch of mixtures of different things. And you want to separate it into its individual things. Well, this is a mixture, okay? So each of those different components of gasoline are combined physically and we can separate them using distillation. So what happens is whatever you start heating this guy up, you put some fire under it. And then uh, the first one that boils is gonna come up here uh, get stopped right here and then it's gonna start flowing down here and then this guy here we've got a uh, water that goes uh, comes out and in right here okay and this tube kinda looks like this okay and so the water that you're putting in goes through here and doesn't mix with what's in here okay so in our case the gasoline will be able to travel through the inner tube straight down this way here down the pipe all right and because we're running water in and out, this guy here is cold. All right, so it condenses this whatever this was that wasn't gas, and it becomes a liquid, and then it can drop out here. Okay, and so then on this beaker, you only get one thing. So here you have a mix. Okay, here you have just one, um, one compound or element or whatever it is that you're trying to separate. All right. And then, so once you've got all of that collected, you can remove the beaker and then put a new beaker in there and start collecting the next thing that boils away. Okay, decanting is kind of like filtration, but it's not as precise. You kind of like, uh, imagine you've got a, a cup full of ice and there's milk in there, right? For whatever reason, the restaurant you're at put ice in your milk and you're like, I don't want ice in my milk. So you take a separate cup, okay, and then you cover up Imagine you cover up the, the ice with the milk in it, okay, like so, and then you start pouring off just the milk part into your new cup, leaving the ice behind. That's decanting, all right? Now, a centrifuge uh, uses centripetal force to mix things and it, uh, or separate things based on their density. So you have like a test tube, okay? If you take a test tube, all right, there's our opening of our test tube. And this is all mixed in. You stick it into a machine that's gonna spin it around and around and around and around really fast that way, or, or the other way, or clockwise, it doesn't really matter. And what happens is the heaviest things, or the things that are most dense, are gonna get pulled towards the bottom of the test tube, and then the things that are next less, most dense and the next most less dense. And they're gonna get separated out that way, all right? Uh, biologists and doctors use uh, centrifuge all the time like it if you go and get your blood drawn then they take your blood and they put it into a test tube and then they spin it around real fast and they use that to count your platelets and stuff like that because they're more dense than like the plasma and other parts that are in your blood all right we're still talking about uh, classifying matter so now we're gonna look at specific properties okay there's two types of properties that we care about there's extensive properties and intensive properties Okay, extensive properties depend on the mass of whatever you have. So if you have, you know, a chunk of aluminum, okay, and it weighs 50 kilograms, okay, and then you cut it in half, so now you've got uh, two chunks of aluminum that are separate from one another, okay, like this, then each one is going to weigh 25 kilograms, right? So mass is an extensive property because it depends on how much you have. The value you have, that property of how massive it is, changes depending on how much you have. Okay. So same with volume, right? If you have 50 milliliters of water and you dump some out, you're going to have 25 or less. Okay, or maybe a little bit more. Okay. Um, so these are these are good examples of extensive properties. So extensive properties are things that it matters how much you have. Then you have intensive properties. I remember this as intensive and independent. Intensive, independent. 
okay? So intensive properties do not depend on mass or they're independent of mass, okay? So think about it this way. So if you have a thimble, you know, like a cup of water and you need it to boil, so you stick it on the stove and you want it to boil, what temperature does it need to get to? Well, it needs to get to 100 degrees Celsius to boil. All right. Now, what if you had an ocean's full of water, right? So the, you got a whole ocean full of water, and you want that to boil. Well, what temperature do you need to get the ocean to? Well, you also need to get it to 100 degrees Celsius. It doesn't really matter how much water you have. The boiling point is always going to be 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. Think about it uh, like if you have, um, uh, so if you have like a chunk of uh, Play-Doh that's blue. So you have blue Play-Doh. Okay. Play-Doh, okay, and then you cut it in half, right? Both colors, both halves of that thing are still going to be blue. No matter how much you cut that down uh, the or how much you add on to it, as long as you use blue, it's always going to be blue. And so those are independent proper, independent of mass or intensive properties, okay? Uh, some more stuff on the periodic table. So I thought I'd include this just for you guys to understand. There's a whole slew of elements. All the elements come up with names from different ways. Um, these are an example of elements where their name and their symbol don't seem like they line up very well. Like so, the antimony has the symbol Sb, okay, and it's because this uh, element name we call it antimony now, but the older name for it was stibium. So Sb stibium makes sense. Uh, like copper here, Cu, that's the symbol for copper. It used to be known as cuprum. So here's a whole list. So this might help you remember things. Like lead, we say it's Pb because it came from the Latin term plumbum. Okay, it's kind of a fun name in and of itself. All right, regions of the periodic table. Okay, uh, pause the video here and your notes packet or on another uh, periodic table you've got. Go ahead and start recording down these values. Okay, or these things. So the nonmetals are the green areas. Most most of the nonmetals are on the right hand side over here. Okay, the metals except for hydrogen. We'll talk about that in the next unit. Okay, uh, the metals are the yellow ones. All right, and then the metalloids kind of do the stair step dividing line between the two. All right. Now, when you're looking at the periodic table, the vertical columns of the periodic table are called groups, all right? And then the horizontal ones are called periods, all right? So groups go up and down, and periods go left and right. Uh, the way I remember it is if you're, like, you know, talking with your hands and you're emphatic about something, you're just going to be like, that's period, that's it, period, I'm done, period, you know? Uh, so you're like, group, period, I'm done, period, you're in a group, period, group, period, all right? I know it sounds similar. Silly, but like that's the way to remember it, all right? Group, period, okay? In a group, the elements have similar character chemical properties, okay? So if you're looking at things down a group, then uh, they have similar chemical properties. Like, for example, the first column here in the periodic table, except for hydrogen, okay? All of these guys here are all very reactive with water, okay? Right, they'll blow up. It's like francium is like a, a ton of TNT going off, even just a small chunk of it. Okay, horizontal elements, you know, they go left and right, and there's not really a huge amount of um, pattern to them. They somewhat, but as you go row to row, they vary somewhat regularly. Okay, like um, so, zinc and cadmium have very similar properties, and like the way they vary as you travel across to the right kind of match each other fairly well, which makes sense because zinc and cadmium are in the same group, okay? All right, uh, just a little bit more. We're going to talk about types of elements. So metals, okay, they're good electrical conductors and good heat conductors, okay? So that means they can pass um, energy very re e easily. Most of them are solids at room temperature, okay? They're malleable, meaning they can you can roll or you can hammer or roll them into thin sheets, Okay, they're ductile, means you can turn them into a wire, and they're luster, they have high luster, so they're shiny, okay? So you should be familiar with these properties. They're malleable, meaning you can turn them into thin sheets. They're ductile, meaning you can turn them into wires, okay? And they have good luster, all right? Here's some examples of metals. So notice they're pretty shiny, okay? Uh, like gold, you know, we can turn gold into gold leaf to cover things and make it shiny and pretty. Um, we can also use it to turn it into rings and necklaces and stuff like that. Copper we use as a you know conductor. We use it to conduct electricity. Notice that they've easily turned it into a wire, and then it's also still able to bend and stay together. Okay, 
Uh, this is aluminum foil. It looks like it's around maybe like a chicken thigh or something like that. Okay, and it's also been hammered into a very thin sheet, and but it still like it stays together very well. Okay, non-metals are poor conductors of heat and electricity. So metals were good conductors. Non-metals were bad conductors. Okay, many, many, many of the non-metals are gases. Okay, once they turn into a solid, uh, they're very brittle. Okay, meaning they break apart very easily, and they're not lustrous, meaning they're not shiny at all. So. If you look at these various nonmetals, so this guy's carbon, okay, carbon, it looks like soot because that's what soot is, or like the graphite on your pen pencil, okay. Uh, it, notice how it kind of like sucks in the water, light. It doesn't look like it's shiny at all, okay. Um, then you've got sulfur. Sulfur is also solid at room temperature, okay. And notice how it looks, it's very brittle, okay. It's in a fine, fine powder. There's phosphorus and then iodine. So all these guys here are non-metals and they have share these characteristics. You can't really turn uh, iodine into a wire and expect it to conduct electricity. It doesn't really work very well. Okay. Now remember the metalloids were those the staircase one that separated the non-metals from the metals. Okay. Um, all metalloids are solids at room temperature. Okay, and they're semiconductors, meaning that they're uh, decent at conducting electricity sometimes, but not nearly as good as metals. Okay, so we use semiconductors all the time when we're doing uh, microcircuits and stuff like that for, because their properties are very interesting. And then finally, we have the noble gases. Okay, the noble gases is the final uh, group on the periodic table. Okay, so number 18, way over here. Okay, these are the noble gases. All right, and they have very special properties just because of where they are on the periodic table. So we're going to talk about them separate. They're very unreactive. Okay, like if you take a, a balloon of helium and try to light it on fire, nothing's going to happen to the helium. The the latex will pop, and that's about it. Okay, and all of them are gases at room temperature. Okay, um, and they just kind of chill there. And we'll talk about the reasons behind that uh, later on. And that's it for unit one. Uh, do the practice problems. Check on your stuff. Let me know if you have any questions.